Dialogue with a Doctor, featuring Southwest Florida's leading physicians. Welcome to Dialogue with a Doctor. If you've not been with us before, uh, this is a show where we interview physicians about their craft so that not only you can learn about that, uh, but perhaps about things you might need to know in the future. Uh, this Today we have Dr. Anne-Marie Tremaine, uh, a board certified uh, dermatologist, cosmetic dermatologist, and we've had her on the show before. And um, we're go we'll, we will be talking about um, psoriasis, and everybody has heard about psoriasis. It's on television everywhere. Um, all the drug companies advertise about it. And um, Dr. Tremaine is going to talk to us about why she thinks it's important to talk about psoriasis. And I don't even think people really know what it is. Mm -hmm. Correct. But first, um, let, tell us about yourself and uh, how long you've been here, where you came from, what your training is, sure. et cetera. Um, thanks for having me today. Um, and so I'm a board certified, board certified dermatologist. I've been in Naples now for um, almost two years. And um, I'm from upstate New York originally. Uh, and after training at uh, Syracuse for med school, uh, I actually moved to Texas uh, and did some clinical trials for a year. Um, in, and many of them were actually uh, dealing with the, many of the medications uh, for psoriasis, so I had many c uh, clinical drug trials. Um, and then I moved to California and continued to do s clinical trials for a few years before I did my dermatology residency. Mm -hmm. I practiced out there for a few years uh, and then came to join uh, my partner, Dr. Wasserman. Here in Naples. Here in Naples. And he is also from upstate New York. He is. So yes. there must have been some connection there. You know, we did not know each other back then, uh, but he came out to UC Irvine uh, to interview for a Mohs Fellowship while I was there um, in the residency. And that's where we initially met during his interview and, and kept in touch. Hmm. And um, it was, I sent my mom, my parents relocated down here, and I sent my mom in for Botox and mm. <laughs> to see Dan, and, um, and he said, I need a, a female dermatologist in town. We should get your daughter to move here, and here I am. Well, you never know how things are yeah. going to go. Yes. Um, so where are, you, where are you located in Naples? We have a few offices. Uh, the main office is on Collier Boulevard in East Naples, 8625 Collier Boulevard. Uh, there's also an office on Marco Island, and uh, currently we are also we have an office in downtown Naples on 41. Um, we'll only be there for Good. another six months or so, and then we'll be in a new location after that. And that will be on Goodlett Road. Yes. Just north of the post office. Yes. Somewhere right in there. Exactly. Right? I know where that is. We're very, yes. <laughs> so, um, very good. So let's talk about psoriasis. Um, you know, patients know, I think, the, you know, eczema, seborrhea, psoriasis, they know those words. I don't think they know the difference between any of those words. Uh, but I think psoriasis is much more known to people because it's something that's easy to see. And I think that's one of the things, one of the reasons you wanted to talk about psoriasis. So just. Absolutely. Get, get us going on. What, what is psoriasis? Yes. So yes. So a lot of times when uh, people uh, come into their intake, their first visit with me, we'll ch have them check off their past skin history and they'll check both psoriasis, both eczema, dry skin. Um, so people know, know the names, but they're not always sure which is which. And so mm -hmm. I think many people are, are confused about psoriasis. Um, including the patients that actually have it and, and the general population. So, but psoriasis is a chronic disease of the immune system uh, that we see with characteristic findings on the skin. And uh, 7.5 million Americans have psoriasis. Um, so it's, it's a lot of people. And uh, onset can be at any age, but we see it most commonly um, uh, in young adults age 15 to 30, and then a second peak in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and it's most commonly Caucasians, uh, but can happen in any race or ethnicity. And, uh, you know, we are continuing to research psoriasis uh, pretty heavily, hence all the drug commercials. After they create their drug, they 
advertise their drug. Um, and um, so we're still peeling back the layers, but we know that the immune system is sending faulty cells, faulty signals to the skin cells telling them to grow too rapidly, grow too large, and so they're dividing and growing in matters of days rather than weeks, which would be normal. So then typically, as a skin cell matures and dies, it sloughs off, but these cells are replicating so quickly that they're stacking up on the skin. And so that's when we get the characteristic signs of psoriasis, which are often what we describe as well-demarcated, large, red plaques uh, with silvery scale. Um, and psoriasis can happen from head to toe. We see it on the psoriasis, we see it on the scalp, the palms and the soles, uh, it can affect the nails, um, uh, in, in the armpits and the groin, but the classic locations are the elbows, the knees, and sometimes around the, the umbilicus on the abdomen. So it's a disease, it's an immunological disease. It is, it is. And, uh, and is that why anti-inflammatories don't work that well? Because it's really, it's just uh, messenger molecules are sent to the skin to tell the skin to reproduce faster, and yes. it's just a exactly. hyper, hyperplastic, as we would say. Exactly, exactly. So yes, the, cell, the, the signal just keeps telling the cells to replicate much faster mm. uh, than they should. So, and um, um, most people have a family history of psoriasis. Um, but not everyone, but we know there is uh, an inherent gene that predisposes people to psoriasis, but then there is some trigger that turns it on. And uh, the triggers include uh, infection. The most classic one we talk about, learn about in, in our residency is uh, strep throat. So the presentation will be a young adult, uh, comes in with a sore throat, and then uh, abrupt onset of what we call gut tate psoriasis. So rather than the large plaques of classic psoriasis, we see smaller ones sort of scattered throughout the body. You do a rapid strep and it's positive. Sometimes when you treat the strep throat, the psoriasis does go away and seems to stay away, but for other people it is the onset of their chronic disease that, they're, that we are going to manage over the next many years. Um, other triggers include um, trauma. So I had someone the other day that presented um, after uh, back surgery, and he, actually, he only had psoriasis within the length of the surgical scar. Um, but a cut or a scrape or even sunburn will tr can trigger psoriasis, a phenomenon called Kebner's Kebnerization. Um, but stress can trigger it in certain medications. So there seems to be a, some second event that, that turns it on for people. Uh, so um, the, more, the psoriasis that's more um, involving more of the body or... Yes. The severity of psoriasis is it related to the to their triggers in any way, or is it just not not that we know? So we don't really know why. Um, there's different types of psoriasis: um, uh, plaque psoriasis, gut tate, um, erythrodermic, which is where people are have psoriasis really from head to toe, and we we don't know why people develop one type or another. And has it been? Um any dietary um, chemical related causation been found? No, no. Well, other than, um, so an important point about psoriasis and why we should treat it aggressively is that it is not just a condition of the skin. It is really a systemic condition. Uh, we see that people uh, with psoriasis, if you look at the studies, have increased risk of cardiovascular disease, increased risk of stroke, more likely to have type 2 diabetes, more likely to have metabolic syndrome. And when you treat the psoriasis, these risk factors decrease. Same thing when you lose weight, start exercising. The psoriasis without treatment, you can see it improve. When people stop drinking alcohol, stop smoking, the psoriasis improves. So it's, it is multifactorial, which has been why it's so hard for us to really get to the bottom of the cause um, of psoriasis, um, because there's so much playing a role. We, um, I, we, I've done a show with um, Dr. Phillips. He talks about the microbiome of the gut. Mm -hmm. And has there been any relationship shown there? That, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Because it, you're, 
you know, yeah. it, there's an implication there yes. based on what you just yes, said. But yes. it's with other skin conditions, absolutely. We have a, condi a skin condition called dermatitis herpetiformis um, that's linked with celiac disease and eczema, we're sometimes linked in that way, but psoriasis, I'm not so not, sure. Not, not yet, eh? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. So tell us more about psoriasis. Yes, um, so uh, another important point in terms of um, causation, um, a big misconception um, by by patients themselves, and again, the general population, um, the big question I get is, is it contagious? And it is not. And so that's really important for, for everyone to know um, um, because that feeling, people feel that others are looking at them as if they are contagious. And so um, just education of everyone is important. Um, in terms of, again, the systemic nature of psoriasis, uh, 10 to 30 percent of psoriasis patients will also have psoriatic arthritis, which is a, a destructive arthritis of the joints. So it's actually eating away at the joints and deforming the joints. And um, when a, a patient suffers from arthritis, this type of this type of arthritis um, treatment uh, is imperative. So even more reason to get involved. So that there really you can picture just this this level of inflammation. Uh, really throughout the body. And so the, the psoriatic arthritis is often treated by um, a rheumatologist uh, in conjunction with the dermatologist. So if somebody has a rash of psoriasis, mm -hmm. and just your, your suggestion, they should go to a primary care provider and be evaluated for other diseases? Yes, abs uh, yes, it's something that we need to start considering when someone has a history of psoriasis, everyone needs to be evaluated uh, for joint disease. Um, and then really starting to list out those risk factors, um, mm -hmm. the increased risk of cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease, the extreme importance for healthy diet and exercise um, because it does all seem to be related. I, I believe I saw, um, one article once that was saying um, uh, they thought the adipocytes were carrying a lot of these like inflammatory markers and so people with greater abdominal girth were going to have more inflammation and when they lost weight so mm -hmm. I don't I don't know if you know that's part of the process as well that's getting more and more complicated mm -hmm. to try and figure out yes you know. we're gonna take a short break um, as we're just about halfway through the show. And when we come back, we're, we'll talk more about psoriasis, treatments, yes. uh, other options, okay? Very good. All right. Mm -hmm. We'll take a break. Be right back. At Joint Implant Surgeons of Florida, Dr. Eichten offers state-of-the-art orthopedic care. Dr. Eichten gives special attention to each patient's condition. He listens closely and offers individualized treatment plans, including physical therapy, injections, regenerative medicine treatments, and surgery. Our patients receive a high level of expertise and service, which is unparalleled in any other orthopedic practice. Find out what sets us apart and where your new joints will take you. Take it from one of our patients. It's been a little over a year since Dr. Eichten replaced my right hip. Uh, in seven to eight weeks, I was golfing and enjoying other outdoor activities. Dr. Eichten and the staff were great to work with, and I'm extremely pleased with the results. Welcome back to Dialogue with a Doctor after our short break. Um, we're, doc we're talking with Dr. Anne-Marie Tremaine, um, a practicing dermatologist in Naples, Florida. She's joined Dr. Uh, Wasserman in practice here. Um, they have a busy practice, it's getting busier, uh, busy enough to where they are establishing another location. And we've had you on the show before. Yes. We've talked about different things, but today we're talking about psoriasis. Um, we learned a lot of science about psoriasis in the first 15 minutes. Um, now we're going to talk more about, I guess, how you fix it yes. or what you do yes. to treat Very good. it. Yes. So, and um, with psoriasis, that's what we're doing: treating, not curing. So mm -hmm. at this time, it's a condition 
uh, that is chronic that we manage. Uh, the good news is we have a lot more treatments now than we used to in the past. Uh, there's been a lot of research um, in the field of psoriasis generating um, uh, new treatments um, that are more specific for the inflammatory cascade that's occurring in psoriasis. So it's important for both the patient and the physician together to decide which of these many treatments are right for them. Um, and we kind of do this based on a few different things. So uh, a lot of times, uh, one of the first things I consider is a body surface area. So when I do a physical exam, I will be looking to see how much of the body is covered with psoriasis. And, um, and sometimes if it's a low body surface area, like two or three percent, um, the patient may, may not be too bothered by it, uh, not too symptomatic, and we can get away with uh, topical treatments. Uh, whereas someone has a large body surface area, 50, 20 plus percent, uh, then a cream that comes in a little tube mm -hmm. is not going to cut it, and we need to start. And is usually expensive. And, is it, <laughs> and the generics continue to get more and more yes, expensive. It's awful. Yes. Um, so, so body surface area. But then we also take into account um, how the psoriasis is affecting the patient's life. Um, so again, maybe the patient only has 5% body surface area and one person may be unaffected, where the other person, um, maybe that 5% is on the scalp and it is itchy and painful. Um, it's causing lots of flaking um, that is noticeable socially and at work. Um, so when, because it's well known that psoriasis has a negative, can have a negative impact on quality of life. And so when we start to see that take place, then it's an, another reason to be more aggressive with treatment. Uh, because patients with psoriasis um, have uh, increased uh, troubles uh, with uh, social relationships, um, trouble keeping a job, loss of productivity at work, uh, and also increase uh, um, rates of depression. So if we see any of these things going on, it's time to, to, to jump in and be more aggressive with treatment. Um, if they have joint disease, we're gonna be aggressive with treatment. Um, and then uh, we take into account the patient's risk factors. So our more aggressive treatments have um, side effect profile. So we need to know the patient's past medical history, what medications do they take, family history, and that'll help us guide them to the correct treatment. Um, and then unfortunately, prescription co coverage sometimes guides, uh, mm -hmm. especially with our new, newer medications, uh, guides what treatment we use. Uh, they may not approve a certain one until um, uh, certain others are failed. So we take all of that into consideration. Uh, but there is a stepwise approach. Um, the first line therapy, which really everyone gets out of the gate, is a topical um, application, a cream or an ointment. And there are, there are multiple out there. Um, most commonly we're using a topical steroid uh, or a vitamin D and or a vitamin D analog. So there are these synthetic vit vitamin D3 creams um, that again are telling the immune system um, to stop the signals to decrease the replication of the cells. The vitamin uh, D cream alone works okay, um, but when combined with topical steroids can be quite synergistic. So we usually start this for most, this is where we start most, if not all people, um, but often we're limited by, by body surface area. Um, and uh, so then we kind of move along the therapeutic line and not necessarily the next step, but another step is what's called phototherapy or light therapy. And there's different types. The most common one we use is called narrow band UVB. So that's where we're exposing patients to a narrow portion of the UVB spectrum that is known to again, kind of turn down on that immune system. And uh, we expose patients to the, the UVB light um, two to three times a week for several months. And it's done under the guidance of a physician, uh, either in the physician's office, um, um, or sometimes we or are able to get an at-home unit approved for the patient. Mm -hmm. And um, it can take a little while to start to see it take effect, but it's a, a nice way to really treat the entire body um, quite quickly without some of the side effects that we see with oral and systemic medications. 
Um, it, but it is not okay to, to go to an indoor tanning bed as a method to treat your psoriasis. Uh, that is very different wavelengths of light, um, different bulbs, a much higher dosage. Burns. He burns, uh, and uh, bur sunburns, which can trigger a chemnerizing reaction of psoriasis, um, and a significant Intense. increased risk in melanoma. Mm -hmm. So it really has to be under the guidance of a, of a physician. So. Uh, but a, a very good option for if you're finding someone that has many risk factors that kind of X them out from the next medications, uh, which are systemic medications um, that you're either taking orally or injecting into the skin or infusing into the skin. Um, so uh, these work very well, but they are suppressing the immune system as a whole. So we see, we can see increased risk for infections with these treatments. Um, uh, we have several available orally, and they're actually some of the oral medications are our oldest treatments for psoriasis, like methotrexate and acetretin. Uh, mm -hmm. But they have limitations. You know, they have to have uh, patients have to have blood work drawn uh, quite regularly, so I can monitor the liver and the kidneys. They mm -hmm. consume alcohol. These medications are are off the list, um, and um, um, there is a newer one, oral medication on the market, which probably patients have probably seen commercials for Otesla or Primalast. And what's nice about this treatment is it does not suppress the immune system. It's working at turning down the, uh, the inflammatory signal within the cell. So we're not seeing increased risks of infections. We're not seeing uh, issues affecting the liver. Um, so uh, decreased side effect profile. We don't have to you know, maintain uh, regular lab work. Uh, the downside to it is um, it does not work for everyone and can be slow to work, so people have to be patient with it. Um, uh, insurance coverage can be difficult. And uh, potential side effects, um, which are temporary, but if they happen, can be a little intense, which is uh, nausea, diarrhea, weight loss, and headache. Um, but as now, we, now that we know we're slowly tapering up the dose rather than going straight to a high dose, and people are doing, doing really well and not, not having those side effects anymore. So, um, uh, and then there's the biologics, which are our injectable medications. And these, uh, are, for the most part, uh, patients are injecting themselves at home. Uh, we teach them how to do it. And then, depending, sometimes, some are done um, every other week, some are once a month, some every three months, so there's, there's, there's different options. Uh, but again, so more risk factors with the biologics, although most, we have many people that have been on biologics for years without concern. Um, but we're looking for, um, they have increased risk of infection, uh, in theory, increased risk of malignancy. Uh, and some of them, uh, if you have congestive heart disease, we would not use it because they saw a worsening of congestive heart disease. Um, so again, if we use these medications, I'm following regularly with lab work, I'm checking a TB test once a year, uh, and, and most people really do quite well. And uh, the, the oldest ones are Humira and Enbrel, which are our TNF inhibitors. We have the most safety and efficacy data on these. So if you were leery on trying something, this, these would be the ones to go with because we've been, we've, we're way past the five-year studies and, um, uh, and they work quite well. Uh, but those ones you do have to inject more frequently. Some of the newer ones, uh, Stellara, which is, it inhibits uh, interleukin 17 and 23, um, is only every three months. And then there's also Cosentix and Taltz, which are targeting interleukin 17A. <laughs> and um, so, but as they come on out, they're more um, specific to the psoriasis uh, cascade. So the interleukin-17 is much more specific for psoriasis um, than, the, than the TNF inhibitors, our mm -hmm. first biologics. So we've really um, come a long way and there's no reason uh, for patients to, to suffer with psoriasis. I just read an article yesterday saying the goal, we should have everyone at 1% body surface area. 
um, which has not been mm. something we've discussed in the past, again, because it is a systemic disease that's putting it, people at risk for other things. Um, so uh, it's, Im it's important to take it seriously. So it seems that in, in my patients, there used to be, there were many topical agents to use, and it, it's kind of gone away from that. Is that a, per, a correct perception? Yes, you know, yes. Yeah, so we used to do um, coal, coal tar a lot, mm -hmm. which I still do have compounded sometimes and, and still mm -hmm. works well. Um, and there's anthralin, which I've read in the textbooks, but never used. Um, so a lot of the older ones we don't use as much um, because now these combination of topical steroid and vitamin D3 have come out and they are uh, quite effective. You're right. People would probably rather not use coal tar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why in the vitamin D, um, how does that work? I mean, does that mean taking it orally in higher dosages would help? So interestingly, they have they have looked at it, and um, and that does not seem to help. And so they don't know if that the, the dose hasn't been isn't high enough that we're administering. But no, they have looked into that and um, haven't seen that. And the, the injections, or the, these are not infusions, like some of the biologics are infused. There are some, know. yes, yes. Okay. And like Remicade is, mm -hmm. is one that we sometimes do use. Mm -hmm. um, so there are infusions, but most of the time we're doing subcutaneous injection, injections. And, and people do that at home? At home. And how often would they be done? I know you, I know you said it's different for different drugs, yes. but just uh, generally? Uh, so some are, are every other week. Um, some are once a month, so the, and so there's one that's actually once every three months. So, and for some people, that is a factor. I have someone that's extremely needle phobic, and ultimately we chose uh, Stellara because it's every three month injection. So, well, <laughs> at least not every day. Because yes. I was wondering if it was yes. like twice no. a week or no. once a day. And or? there are some are tw there is one that's twice a week as well. So there, so you kind of. Um, take mm -hmm. that into consideration. Yeah, it's hard to get people to even do insulin yes. every day, let alone do right. something else. Right, so, so. Very good, so yes. in terms of, I know you're well-trained in cosmetic dermatology. Are any, is there any cosmetic dermatological products that are used in, in patients with psoriasis? That's a good or, question. I mean, um, how, how because you're trying to get rid of the, uh, the, these plaques yes, you know, and to make them go away. Yes. Do they leave scars or is there discoloration? Is there... Yes, there yeah. can be. So they, when the, the red inflamed plaque resolves, it can, especially depending on the patient's skin type, mm -hmm. um, it can leave discoloration, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, yes, there can be some creams used to help it fade, but mostly it's, it's tincture of time. Well, good. Yes. Um, we learned a lot about, we're going to wrap it up because we're running out of time. Yes. <laughs> uh, we learned a lot about uh, psoriasis, uh, more than uh, I thought we would learn. Very good. <laughs> um, and um, there's a lot more out there for treatment that I'm yes. sure our patients would like to know about and have learned about. Um, uh, and I think, and I thank you for coming to talk with us yes, today. Yes, no problem, thank you. Okay, <laughs> and we're gonna have you back, uh, I hope, again. Yes. And I don't know what we'll talk about, but oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about something. Okay. You know a lot, thanks for, <laughs> thanks for coming. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes. <laughs>